Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. Personally, I'm not too upset with this game. I do feel like the overreaction on Twitter is bonkers and it went to such an extreme. I should have known better because Sixers Twitter is so toxic, it's worse than Eagles Twitter. And that's saying a lot considering what's happening this season with Nick Sirianni, Howie Roseman, Carson Wentz. It's absurd. So for me to say that is really telling you how I feel about Sixers Twitter and how brutal it can be. They lose bad games. NBA championship caliber teams lose bad games. You know what happened after the Lakers lost to the Sixers? They fell to their next opponent who they should have waxed. The Sixers lost to the Detroit Pistons, and then they beat the Los Angeles Lakers. Just because you lose to a team you should beat, it doesn't mean much. The Bucks lose the teams they should beat. The Nets lost to the Cleveland Cavaliers right after the James Harden trade. Everyone's freaking out. They lose bad games, and then they bounce back, and they beat good teams, and then they show that they're strong. It's a 72-game season. This team was 16-6 and heading into the night, and I'm fully aware that the Portland Trail Blazers only had a certain amount of guys. Damian Lillard, C.J. McCollum, Nurkic, Collins, these players were not running up and down the floor. So what? So what? The Sixers didn't have their game today. So what? What? I don't think any different about this team because of this outcome than I did prior to this matchup. I think that they will still be who they are. When Ben Simmons is available, they will be a different team. They are undefeated with the starters. And I do want to hit on the Ben Simmons thing because I do feel like there's the extreme, and I hate to bring politics into this, but with politics, there's the extreme lefts, the extreme rights, and they're both legitimate psychopaths. But there's an extreme when it comes to Ben Simmons. The extreme, this guy blows. Get rid of him for anything. Get rid of him for a bag of basketballs and some water bottles. And then there's the other section of fans that's like, this guy is God. This guy is Jesus Christ on a basketball floor. And it's just not the case. I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, it pisses people off. Uh, Apparently, those extreme Ben Simmons supporters came after me tonight because they were going with the philosophy of, see, see how important he is. Yes, sorry that bringing up two elite players in the NBA as people I would trade him for is so terrible. Oh, God forbid that I say I would trade Ben Simmons for James Harden and Bradley Beal, and I would question Zach Levine. I wouldn't even be automatic. It would take Zach Levine and some for me to even consider it, but I would still be very skeptical of Zach Levine. That's not throwing shade at Ben Simmons. That's appreciating his value, saying he deserves to be in trade packages for legit studs in this league. But getting back to my point, So many Ben Simmons loyalists and and lovers went to the extreme of, of saying, this is what you get when Ben doesn't play. There's definitely truth to the defense not being as strong because Ben is the leader on the defensive side. There is truth to saying that some of these three point shots weren't as effective and the offense wasn't as fluid because Ben Simmons wasn't facilitating. There is truth to that. I am not denying it whatsoever, but let's not act as if Ben Simmons has not been a part of hideous losses where he hasn't been what we needed him to be in really bad games where you should walk all over an opponent, but Ben Simmons had two field goal attempts or Ben Simmons didn't show up or Ben Simmons had eight turnovers. Like, I'm fully aware that this guy is very unique. He's got an awesome skill set that benefits this team. He could also have one flaw in his game that screws up the entire offense in half-court sets, in slowed-down games, in playoff series. Only time will tell if that gets fixed based off of Joel Embiid's play, based off of how strong Tobias Harris has been and how confident he has been playing to start the season. And the roster in general, having natural spacing surrounding him, maybe that impacts how teams have to defend the Sixers when things intensify a bit. But to act as if Ben Simmons being plopped into this game automatically means 
all of those three-point shots would have been hit and everything would have absolutely 100% changed, I can't go down that road. I'm sorry. Some of those three-pointers early that were bricking and clanking off the rim, they were good looks. They were open looks. The guys just missed them. I thought it was one of those nights where the Sixers just didn't have it going for them. Second half of the back-to-back, maybe they thought that they would walk all over this team based off of the personnel on the other side. And let's give credit to the Portland Trail Blazers. Normally, I don't do this because I don't think they deserve it most of the time. But I thought, for what it was, the Trail Blazers actually played well at the same time. For as poor as the Sixers played, I actually thought some of those Trail Blazers players battled it out and gave you a lot of effort and ultimately that was a a result in winning. Winning was a result of their work ethic and I can see why fans are upset with the energy level and the lack of effort at times getting out rebounded the third quarter the trailblazers start off on a 14-0 run and somewhat push it away. I can see and be aware of why that is frustrating and whatnot, but in terms of now screaming that this team sucks, this team is bad, this is so unacceptable, this is so putrid, it's not so putrid. Good teams in an 82-game season win high 50s. In the high 50s. Mid 50s. In an 82-game season. So do the math. How many losses are those? Like, how many losses is that? Do the damn math! And guess what? All of those losses, if you win 55 games in a normal 82-game season, they're not all against the Boston Celtics, the Lakers, the Brooklyn Nets, the top dogs in this league. Not every loss comes against those teams. Sometimes you have a stinker. Sometimes it's not your night. And I think a lot of that had to do with Joel getting the ball through that first half so much. Some guys get cold. It's hard to get into a rhythm. It's hard to get a feel of the game. It's hard to really find yourself offensively. And that's not a knock on Joel Embiid, but I just think that happens because you keep constantly going to the same guy over and over and over and over and over again. Well, you stand around, you get a little cold. It's hard to really get involved and engaged in a game like you would if you were able to space the ball out a little more. And that's just kind of how this game all played out. But Joel Embiid was insane. Scene. He was incredible. Whether it was the face-up game, the jab steps over and over and over again until he hit that face-up mid-ranger, mid-ranger, mid-range game. I saw him get double-teamed right around the free-throw line. He decided to fade away one-footed and get fouled. And oh, by the way, he knocked down that free throw as well. Now, this game didn't come without a scare. In that first quarter, Joel Embiid, his knee buckled. And they're saying he hyperextended his knee. I almost threw up. I was so scared. It looked bad. Non-contact injury. You saw his entire knee shift. And the fact that he got up so slow, and then he's he's somewhat leaning on his knees like he was hunched over and feeling out his kneecap, he walked to the locker room, and when all that happened, I didn't really know what to think. It was like I was emotionally lost, and my brain shut off in that moment because I was just trying to process what was going on. You heard some awkward silence throughout the broadcast because it was almost as if Mark Zumoff and Allah had to register what was happening, and they and they were in shock mode, too. I think every Sixers fan, anyone watching that game, sort of went into a state of shock. You have a guy playing at an MVP level, where you recognize this dude is playing at an elite, elite, dominant, insane level. Not just a great level. Not just an unstoppable level. But this ridiculous level that you can't even put into words. You can't describe this. This is arguably the greatest thing I've ever seen from someone in this city. This is insanity. How many times do you watch shaking your head with this big smile on your face? Like you can't believe it. It's so hard to fathom that this guy is on the Sixers and his game has elevated this much. When you need a bucket, he is getting you this bucket and it happens every game. Now eventually... He needed some help from his teammates, all right? The 37 points he finished with, he only had six in the second half. It wasn't as strong and it wasn't as dominant, but you can only keep that pace up for so long. You're eventually going to have to have someone knock down shots. I was thrilled to see him return. And once again, that just adds another layer to this is a different Joel Embiid. 
there have been maybe seven or eight or nine or ten different times this season where in years past the organization would have went with a calmer approach. This year it's, you're playing. Even when it was the fourth quarter, you're playing. It's a blowout. I think Doc wanted to see if the starters could spark some sort of run based off of what we saw the other night against the Indiana Pacers where they came back in this epic way and it was all sparked. Late fourth quarter, late in the game, the Sixers went on this crazy run. Maybe he thought, well, they just did this the other night, so why not try it? My point, though, is Joel Embiid is playing regardless of if he's nicked up, regardless of the score, regardless of the time. It's the second half of a back-to-back. You're playing, Joel Embiid. No one's stopping this guy from that mentality, and, and that's something that should be so recognized and so appreciated from the big man. No reason to be concerned anymore about the, oh, should we baby him? Should we put him in bubble wrap? If you're good to go and if you feel good and it was just a hyperextended knee, go out there and play. Because I think, if, if anything, I think that's one of the reasons why he's continuing to, to be okay. Because you're not pretending like he deserves to be in bubble wrap. I think the more you put a guy in bubble wrap and you stress the injury so much with someone, it's more likely to happen. If you're so afraid of the injury, sometimes that's a reason why it, it does happen. Because of the way you play, it's always in your head, the style, you're always focused on it. Just go play. Be you, go play. And I truly think it's it's a big mentality switch in Joel Embiid. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about anything that happened in the past and how much you've been banged up before. If you're good, go. You're not going to be 100%. No one in the NBA is at 100%. It's sort of like football. If you only play when you're 100% in an NFL season, guess what? You're playing week one and you're playing the first drive, if you're lucky, the second drive. After that, you're going to be a little bit bruised. You're going to be tired. You're going to have swelling. Now go through it. And to be clear, I'm not saying that this guy has to play all 82. I know what rest days are for, and I think that they are valuable, and you throw them in throughout. But you got to find a good balance. You need to find a good mix. 31 points out of the 57 points in that first half. It was incredible. Every time. He either did bully ball, he had the face-up game, The jab step, posting up where he wanted to, posting up early, and then backing an opponent down to his comfort zone. Not only that, establishing position deep into the paint where he doesn't have to back anybody up. He just says, I want to be here. I'm going to be here. Give me the rock and I'll lay it up with these. You name something that Joel Embiid can do, and he flashed it. He showed you, I can I can absolutely bring this element to my game, and you're not going to stop me. The only thing that wasn't there like it was in the last game was the three-point shooting. He's picking and choosing his spots differently. It's not the same as it was in, in previous seasons. Less time shooting the threes, more efficient shooting the threes. I think that goes hand in hand. I think he's become a better shooter, but if you take more, well, guess what? There's more chances to miss, and that plays a role in his percentage. But he's picking and choosing the right spots. Not so much of that in this game for him. Hell, not so much of that from the entire team. Danny Green, Seth Curry. It was a slump for those guys. And Seth Curry, that was a weird one. He didn't return, and apparently he felt sick. That's a little iffy, considering this guy has been out with COVID before. Now, some are saying, I haven't seen this guy play well since he came back. No, I remember him coming out guns blazing as if he didn't miss a step. I remember specifically saying, wow, nothing can stop Seth Curry, not even COVID. This guy came back, and he was right back into action. I think it's more of he's not a 60% shooter. Now, he's not a 0% shooter from three either. I think he's just going through a slump right now. But for him to be not feeling good, that's not a great sign, obviously. It's not a great sign, and I just hope that everything's okay with him in terms of the COVID stuff, and you know nothing's really happening from that aspect, from that angle. This team is on a four-game win streak, so they lost. So they lost. I, I don't care. If they beat the Brooklyn Nets, no one is going to care that they lost against the Portland Trailblazers. And I'm not saying that 
they have to 100% win. Even if they lose to the Nets, I'm not going to specifically cry about it. I want them to compete and be involved in the game. I want to see it. It's a test. All of these games against the big matchups and all of these games in the regular regular season against a really big opponent, that's just about the matchup. Not so much the outcome. How does it play out? What do you see? It's all about the eye test. Regular season is about the eye test and learning things about your team. It's not about all games. Not every game tells you something. If you think about a percentage breakdown, maybe 75% of the regular season, you learn something about the team you study, the team you analyze. Tonight, these are one of those games that fall in the 25% range where it's like, okay, all right, throw it out. Don't worry about it. The offense was stagnant at times and they couldn't really get in the rhythm. All right, so be it. One of those games. It happens. It happens. It hasn't been this common theme for this team. This type of outing, it's not a common theme. They were 16-6 and with the best record in the Eastern Conference prior. Before this game, everyone looked at those standings and said, Bros, look how great this team is. So now they have one slip-up, one bad one to make them 16-7. and And now all of a sudden, they're this different team. That's why when I talk about this all the time, I don't buy in to 16 and 6 right away. And I don't buy in to a bad loss right away. I keep it consistent. If a team has strong eight games to start the season, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're automatically this championship team. If a squad has a bad five game stretch, I don't write them off and say this team is awful and this team blows. Just like Seth Curry to me doesn't automatically blow. You got to allow time. You got to allow enough of a sample size for you to really know what this team is. If they have 10 hiccups in 70 games, if they have 12 bad losses in 72 games, doesn't that mean your team is still good? The answer is yes. Go look at all the championship winning teams over the last 20 years. Look how many regular season losses they had. Go through the game log if you like. I promise you there's bad stinkers. I'm just not going to put a lot of stock into this personally. This specific individual game, I'm not going to cry as if this team is now pathetic, awful, you know, how, how dare they. This night, I don't have that vibe. You might though, and I'm curious to see what the Anytime Hotline is like. Some other things first, though. My buddy texted me, right? Shout out to Dean. Text me, goes, this is sickening. And I respond, LOL. I'm not worried about it at all. He goes, I'm not worried, but I'm still pissed. How can you play this lazy? No excuse for it. My response, it's the NBA regular season. I don't care. They have nine players and are missing their top four. And here's the best way to describe it. This is the best way I see it. It's like screaming at the guy who doesn't run out to first base in game 82 of 162 in the fourth inning. Seriously, that's the way that I see this. Who cares? So Jimmy Rollins didn't run out first base. Didn't run out hard. But he runs out hard when it's the playoffs. But he runs out hard when it matters. This is game 82 of 162 in an MLB season. So Jimmy Rollins doesn't run out hard for one at-bat. I can live with that. You know why? Because majority of the time, most of the time, this team is giving me the effort, is giving me the outcome that I want to see. I don't think it's that ridiculous. Now, he responds with, it's one thing if you lose to a team at full strength. They are losing to a G League team and, and, and Embiid scored 30 in the first half. I still don't care. You're losing Saturday too. This effort is pathetic. To lose to a team with five no-names at home, inexcusable! To me, come on. Come on. Really? I just see it totally differently. I value the NBA regular season differently than most, apparently. All right. Let me tell you about my friends over at DraftKings. 
The 55th Super Bowl is this weekend. 55. And a game this big deserves a big prize. Not just some trophy. And DraftKings, the official daily fantasy sports partner of Super Bowl 55, has up to $55 million in total prizes up for grabs with their Super Bowl prediction challenge. How's that for big? All you have to do to get your share of these huge prizes is enter DraftKings' free Super Bowl prediction challenge. Once you submit your picks, you will get a free instant prize up to $25,000. And if you have the most predictions correct, you can win the top prize of one million dollars. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code BRODES to enter the free $55 million Super Bowl prediction challenge. Everyone gets an instant prize up to $25,000 just for playing. So use promo code BRODES now and enter the free $55 million Super Bowl challenge. Only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55. Terms, conditions, and eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. And I think it's funny that a game like this, I mean, I just look big picture. Let's keep it real. I always look big picture. As much as I try not to and I like to enjoy the ride, I look big picture. Big picture is Joel Embiid is a championship contender MVP player. That's big picture. That's what I care about more so than now they're 16 and 7 instead of 17 and 6. You have Joel Embiid. The most important thing, you have Joel Embiid. That's the most important thing. And if you have that, you're in a really good chance of doing some damage. That's what's important to me. That's how I see this. But I want to know from you. I put this question out on Twitter as soon as the game ended. What category do you fall in? How dare they lose? Unacceptable! Or, I'm not happy, but I understand. That was the question I laid out. So you have two options. I want to hear what you had to say. This was the worst game of the season by far. Uh, I mean, you could say what you will about Ben not being in tonight, but the fact remains that Portland was extremely shorthanded tonight. So in my opinion, there was no excuse for this loss tonight. But I, I mean, I get it. Every good team has a, has a garbage game once in a while. I mean, you can't expect perfection every night. Uh, so I'm not super concerned, even though everybody played like garbage except for Embiid. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they were just careless and sloppy and played like trash. Uh, especially ahead of Saturday night's game against Brooklyn, they they really need to get their act together. And I think just the fact that they'd be going up against Brooklyn, everyone will rise, everyone will play better. Will they play good enough? I don't know. I don't know what to expect when it comes to this Sixers matchup against the Nets. I truly don't, and that's why I'm so excited to see it go down because I have no clue. I think it's going to be two top talented teams throwing haymakers back and forth. The Brooklyn Nets have a ton of talent offensively. They can get abused defensively. The Sixers have a great defense. They might not be as lethal offensively, so how will that counter one another? Only time will tell. It's not really about the matchup for Saturday so much tonight. It's a game where, as you mentioned, a lot of the guys play bad, everyone except for Joel Embiid. Do I think Ben Simmons being inserted into the lineup now makes every single player that played so bad play insanely better and be the best version of themselves? No, I don't, but will it help? Absolutely. I thought defensively the motor was lost because Ben is the guy that's, that slaps the floor, if you will, not physically, not actually, but in terms of that mentality, he is so damn solid and he brings it on that side of the floor that it sparks the teammates to do it too. It, it's sort of like when you're captain. I'm thinking of hockey right now just because that's my personal experience. But when you see your captain throwing hits in the corner, when you see your captain playing with that intensity and really being that motor on the ice, it brings it out of everybody else. Yeah, Ben Simmons does that, but I also think the guys just played bad too. I mentioned some of these three-point shots early, while there might not be as much space, still enough space for these guys. I've seen Tobias Harris hit some of these threes that he didn't hit tonight. I've seen Danny Green hit some of these threes that he didn't hit tonight. The shots did not fall, and that is going to happen. I am not downplaying what Ben Simmons brings to this team. I have not been happy with Ben Simmons. He has not given enough for me offensively early on. There was a stretch over five, six games recently where he gave you almost 16 points per game, where he wasn't turning the ball over, where he was shooting 60% from the field. That's okay with me. I'm not a Ben Simmons has to shoot threes. That's the only thing I expect from him, guy. I'm saying what he gave you when he averaged 11 points per game and he was turning the ball over was way too much. So I know what Ben Simmons can provide. That's why I only give you a handful of players that I would ever imagine actually trading him for. 
I can be frustrated with him and still be fully understanding of what he means to an NBA team. There's a reason why people pick up the phone and say, oh, Ben Simmons is on the table. Hold on, right? Like, there's a reason why Ben Simmons gets you stars back. He is valued to that degree. And I see that. I know that. I can be mad and upset with what he did early this season and still recognize that he plays an important role with this team's success. I'm just pointing out, Ben Simmons has been on the floor in brutal losses too. There's been plenty of times where he hasn't shown up, where he had a bad night. We talk about how Matisse and, uh, you know, other guys, just other guys around this team. Tobias wasn't the best version of himself. All these players, except for Embiid, didn't have the best version of themselves tonight. Who's to say Ben would have? Who's to say maybe Ben, maybe Ben was in the same category as the other guys tonight? To act as if Ben couldn't have had a bad night or this team could have lost with Ben Simmons, that's where the disconnect is for me. I think it's different when Joel is not available compared to when Ben is not available. And that's because Joel Embiid is arguably the best player in the league right now. Now, I'm not saying he's better than LeBron or whatever. I mean, obviously, LeBron is LeBron. His legacy speaks for himself. But he's arguably the best player in the entire league right now. I think him being off the floor is a little different than Ben Simmons being off the floor. And I respect what Ben Simmons does, even though that he makes me want to punch myself in the face and make my nose bleed. Well, this game is pretty bad. Um, I side on the that it's just a bad loss. I mean, they're probably looking to head towards Brooklyn. Um, it's, it is what it is. It's regular season. You're going to win some. You're going to lose some. Um just get through this one and then just start focusing on Brooklyn and hopefully you can take down Brooklyn. All right, as always, love your podcast and have a good one, bud. Thank you so much. One thing I haven't hit on yet, by the way, Cork Boss with the start. I had so many people reaching out, bro, are you excited for this one? Yeah. Cork Moss being in the starting lineup in a game like tonight. Come on. Really? Does it matter? That's not his role. What he did tonight is irrelevant to his role. I'm a long-term, long-window guy. I look at what does this mean for the team when it comes to games that matter. Well, Furkan Korkmaz being in the starting rotation and Seth Curry playing point guard, I can't take much out of this, and that's why it falls in that 25% range. I can't take a lot out of this because it was so wonky. It was so outrageous. It wasn't who this team is. It's not their true identity. So it's hard to really grasp a ton of information except for Joel Embiid. Wow. Because that relates. <laughs> By the way, Dwight Howard coming off the bench for him. Whew. Sometimes he is on another level. And I'm saying that in a bad way. He blows my mind. I don't get it. Some nights of Dwight, it's A+. plus. Some nights of Dwight... I have no idea how he's on the basketball floor and the decisions that he makes. It's like he's lost. He's clueless. But then he'll give you 15 rebounds in 12 minutes, and he's awesome. And he's the best thing to ever step on the floor when Joel Embiid leaves the floor. But it's way too up and down, way too extreme. I wonder if you're going to see more Ben Simmons at the five throughout. I wonder if that's your best bet. If you're going to stagger some minutes... Although, I don't know if you can live with that. That's going to be tough because Ben's going to be playing 40-something minutes and postseason minutes. So you're going to have to find time for him to play the five and then pull Dwight Howard's minutes back even more. I don't know. But if you get some of the performances that you get out of Dwight in the playoffs, it's not going to be good. It's definitely not. Hunter, just watching this uh, Philly-Portland game, somebody's got to ask Doc Rivers, you lose two series where you're up three to one. Do games like these correlate to series losses later in the season? Well, what time do we hold folks accountable? Tobias, that's my guy. But my goodness, he was horrible tonight. Thanks for listening. I don't think tonight. I don't look at tonight and go, you know what? Doc Rivers, that that showed me why he loses three one series. 
I just don't personally tie that together. Now, there are things that do show up where I question, is there a correlation? For example, Doc Rivers is big on, I'm going to run the same play over, over, and over, and over, and over again. If I see it have success, I'm just going to always run it until it gets stopped. And I just wonder if that philosophy sometimes backfires because, well, let's say they run plays. The plays work, and then the other team counters. And then the Sixers eventually maybe go back to that play because they know it was successful, and then the team somewhat has it figured out. But Doc saw it work so many times before. He keeps trying to run it and run it and run it, and the other team has the answers for it. That would be something where I say, okay, maybe I can tie the two together. Maybe I could connect the dots, if you will, and and see the correlation between the issues in the playoffs and the lack of adjusting and Doc Rivers falling. Like, is there a correlation behind that? Here, I, I don't see that. Go back to that season with the Boston Celtics when he won a championship with Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, that team, Paul Pierce, You think there is a hiccup along the way in the regular season? I guarantee it. I don't know how I can put the puzzle pieces together and say Doc Rivers' flaws in the postseason relates to what I saw tonight. Am I going crazy to say that? I don't think so. I I think that's a pretty logical way to approach this. Hey, Broads. Big fan here of yours. I love watching your stuff. Um, Actually, I'm from Canada, funny enough. But uh, I just about the game tonight versus the Blazers, you know, I think the biggest thing is just uh, getting a, another guy who can really run an offense um, outside of Ben Simmons as, as much as he can be frustrating. Seems like the shooters play way better when he's not, when he's on the floor um, instead of when he's on the bench or not playing. So I think a trade that Daryl Moore should be looking for is finding someone like, a, you know, best case scenario, Kyle Lowry, who can really, uh, you know, run an offense and, and even at some times fill the defensive role or part of the defensive role. I don't think it would be as good as Kyle Lowry. I think that's way too wishful thinking. But I've been on this, right? I've been on this topic for a couple weeks now. Of Shake Milton might not be that guy that you really want him to be off the bench. And that's not to say he can't ever become that guy. But I think it's evident and it's clear that that's not who he is this season. And with Joel Embiid playing this way in his prime, you got to pounce on a lot of opportunities because you don't know how many chances you're going to get. Who knows how long... Joel Embiid is going to be able to play this way for every, every. I mean, I'm just anticipating it to last a little longer than just one year, of course, but I'm just saying you got to pounce on this. This is rare. This is unique. This is not normal. This is not standard. You have Joel Embiid playing at this height. If you can have a chance to go out and make a trade, you don't wait on Shake Milton. You got to go out and get one. And a name that seems more realistic to me would be a Derrick Rose type that's on a team like Detroit who stinks and is not going to be competing. And you go out and get a veteran guard who can help you run the offense. He can give you versatility. And he's been around the block. And he has moments throughout the NBA. He has experience. That's more realistic than a Kyle Lowry, in my in my opinion. I think that's way too much of a reach. But I think we're on the same page in terms of being able to get a guy that can help run this offense for sure. Hey, bro, just a poor effort for the Sixers tonight. They fell for the trap game, looked past their competition. You know, I'm not overly upset right now. Uh, you can't win them all. It's not the end of the world. But I do need to ask this one question. Maybe you can help me out with this. Last night, the Flyers, another first-place team, just like the Sixers, lost the President's Trophy winning Bruins last night with one of the best power plays in the league in overtime. And Everyone lost their mind last night about it. Everyone was going crazy. Everyone was saying, you can't lose that game no matter what. And yet tonight, people are really fine with the Sixers losing a game against the Portland Trailblazers without the three best players. Seems like kind of a double standard that one first-place team in the Flyers aren't allowed to lose a game, even if they get a point out of that game, while the Sixers, if they lose the team to a bunch of uh, G League guys and only nine players, everyone's fine with it. That's just weird to me. Uh, Take care, Brits. I understand what you're saying. I do. I get your point. But here's the difference. The Flyers were up 3-1 to and took three insanely brutal, uncharacteristic penalties to lose the game in such a heartbreaking way. What would be equivalent to that? If the Sixers lost to the Lakers and Tobias Harris did not hit that shot, that's a different loss compared to this. If the Flyers lose 7-1 to on a random Tuesday night and it wasn't their game, it's like, all right, whatever, you shake it off, it's one of those games. But there's a difference between 
it being one of those games, one of those random regular season games where you just don't have it that night compared to where you went out there and you lost the game when you had it in your grasps. Two totally different scenarios. You watch the Lakers surge and come out big in the fourth quarter and make this crazy run where Anthony Davis was cutting to the rack. LeBron hit him with this fantastic pass and they took this lead late. If you would have lost that game, that's not one where you sit back afterwards and say, oh, it was one of those games. Just you don't have it that night. That's not the same feel. That's not the same vibe. So that's where the difference is. That's how those are in in two totally different categories. If they would have lost to the Charlotte Hornets after being up 26, that's not the same as everyone being off, everyone missing all their shots. You were only involved because of Joel Embiid. Everyone except for Joel Embiid realistically had a tough night at the office. Now, Tyrese Maxey made a couple shots later on when the game was sort of a blowout. He finished with 15 points in 21 minutes. But for the most part, in the real moments of the game, when it was actually somewhat of a contest, no one really showed up. That's different when all the shots aren't falling and when your offense isn't flowing well. and It doesn't feel right. That's different than being up 26 and allowing a team to surge back in and losing the game. Or having the Lakers right where you want them and falling apart. So to me, it's two different circumstances. You're comparing apples to oranges. But I understand what your mentality is when explaining that. So let me know all of your thoughts down below in the comments section. Before I let you out of here, Orbit Energy and Power is home to your solar experts. They've been in the business for over 20 years of experience. They are solar experts in residential and commercial projects, and they are dedicated to making sure that your project is completed easily and properly by using high-quality materials and trained professionals. To get the job done right, their solar program eliminates your electric bill completely by offering flexible financing solutions such as zero dollars down. There's no risk and no need for investment. They also provide water purification systems, backup energy services, battery storage, and more. So visit their information. It's all down below. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you next time.